The Dance of the Dragons It is by far the most devastating war in Westerosi history, a conflict of succession that ruined a house and divided the realm. There were two claimants for the Iron Throne, Aegon Targaryen and his half-sister, Rhaenyra. Those that supported the former were known as the Green Faction and those that supported the latter were the Black Faction. Because of their ambitions for power, they started a war of fire and blood, betrayal and vengeance, division and anarchy. This war was known as the Dance of Dragons. In Season 1, we saw how the seeds of this war were planted, as Episodes 1 to 10 adapted the first two and a half chapters of this time period. Episodes 1 to 8 were clearly an adaptation of the chapter, Heirs of the Dragon, A Question of Succession. From the Great Council of 101 AC, all the way to the death of the King, Viserys I. Episode 9 and half of 10 were an adaptation of the next chapter, The Blacks and the Greens, with the title of the chapter being used for each episode. Episode 9 was the Green Council, which adapted the conspiracy by the Green Faction to crown Aegon Targaryen as the King of Westeros. Episode 10 was then titled The Black Queen, and it showed how the Black Faction's members rallied behind Rhaenyra and accepted her as their leader and queen. However, this was only half of Episode 10, because the other half adapted a part of the next chapter of the book, The Dying of the Dragons, A Son for a Son. In this chapter of the book, the son of Rhaenyra, Lucerys Valarian, is murdered in the sky by Aemon Targaryen and his dragon, Vagar. It is a turning point in the war, and Episode 10 adapts it pretty close to how it happened in the book. However, Episode 10 ends after the event occurs. It doesn't go further to adapt the next part of the chapter, which details the retaliation by the Black Faction. This is likely what Season 2 will do in its first episode. It will complete the next half of this important chapter, and it is why the episode is titled after it, A Son for a Son. These words are expressed by Daemon Targaryen in a letter to Rhaenyra after they discover how Lucerys died. Though on the show, we see how Lucerys' death was an accident, the retaliation by Daemon and Rhaenyra is anything but that. An eye for an eye, a son for a son, Prince Daemon wrote. Lucerys shall be avenged. You must remember that as a young man, Daemon Targaryen was the leader and Lord Commander of the Gold Cloaks in King's Landing. During his time serving in this post, he became acquainted with a man known as Blood, a big and brutal sergeant of the City Watch who was fired after he killed a prostitute with his bare hands. After the death of Lucerys, Daemon hires Blood and another man known as Cheese who is a rat catcher from the Red Keep, to sneak into the castle and complete a job for him. In the book, it's said that they snuck into Alison's bedchambers, tied her up and gagged her, awaiting the arrival of Helena, whom they knew always visited her mother with her children in the evenings. And that is exactly what she did in this case. It's said that when Helena finally showed up, blood and cheese killed her guards, barred the door, and snatched her children away from her. Scream and you will die, Blood told her grace. Queen Helena kept her calm, it is said. Who are you? she demanded of the two. Debt collectors, said Cheese. An eye for an eye, a son for a son. Damon had instructed Cheese to make Helena choose which one of her sons she wanted for them to kill. Her eldest born son, Jaehaerys, or her younger boy, Maelor. At first, Helena refused to choose, telling Cheese to kill her instead. However, Cheese told her that if she didn't choose, then Blood would essay her daughter and kill them all anyway. So Helena had no choice. Maybe it was because Jaehaerys was the heir to the Iron Throne, or maybe she thought that Maelor was too young to understand, but at the end of the day, Helena chose Maelor to die. You hear that, little boy? Cheese whispered to Maelor. Your mama wants you dead. Then he gave Blood a grin, and the hulking swordsman slew Prince Jaehaerys, striking off the boy's head with a single blow. The queen began to scream. It is said that Helena never recovered from the death of Jaehaerys. She was so struck with grief 
that she never left her bedchambers, never bathed or ate, and she didn't even sleep with the king anymore. In fact, she couldn't even bring herself to look at her son, Melor, ever again. So full of guilt and shame she was. And Aegon wasn't any better, though grief played out differently for the king. He ordered for every rat catcher in the city to be seized and killed, and he even caught Cheese and tortured him until he confessed. Thereafter, the king only knew rage and bitterness, wanting revenge for the death of his son more than anything else. Fuck dignity! I want revenge. So that's how the season will likely begin. The tale of blood and cheese being what's adapted for episode 1. It will complete the chapter titled The Son for a Son from Fire and Blood. The rest of the season will adapt the next chapter, The Dying of the Dragons, the Red and the Gold. This chapter begins with the Battle of the Burning Mill, so it's likely that the second episode will adapt this event in some way. The Battle of the Burning Mill was the first battle of the war, and it was started by Blackwood raiders that invaded the lands of the Brackens, burning their villages and crops, and killing their livestock and small folk. The Brackens eventually do muster up a force to repel the Blackwood invasion, but they are ultimately overwhelmed by the forces of the Riverlands as they are led by Daemon atop his dragon, Caraxes. We do see some of this in the trailers, and we do see Daemon making threats to some people in a foreign land, so it's likely that he might be talking to surrendering Brackens. Our terms are very simple. Renounce the false king and bend the knee to the king. Or your house burns. Eventually, the Blacks take the Riverlands and hold Harrenhal, a fact that gives Aegon and the Greens a lot of anxiety and concern. In the book, Aegon puts a lot of trust in Otto during this time, but the Hand does seemingly fail to respond to the threats posed by the Black faction. Instead of sending armies and mercenaries to deal with these forces, Otto writes letters to the Iron Islands and the Free Cities in order to try and get some ships to break the blockade imposed by the Valarians in episode 10. Further seal the gullet, we can cut off all seaborne travel and trade to King's Landing. For a long time, Otto's letters do not seem to be yielding any results, and this frustrates Aegon because of the pressure that he gets from the rest of the city. The blockade leads to angry merchants and riots, which might be what we see in the trailers as Alicent and Helena flee from the small folk. Since Otto's letters do not seem to be yielding any results, Aegon appoints Sir Criston Cole to be his Hand of the King instead. My new hand is a steel fist, he boasted. We are done with writing letters. Sir Criston Cole doesn't waste time proving his mettle to the King as he uses brute force and intimidation to crush his enemies. It is not for you to plead for support from your lords, like a beggar pleading for alms, he told Aegon. You are the lawful king of Westeros, and those who deny it are traitors. It is past time they learn the price of treason. Sir Criston then beheads any lords that still refuse to bend the knee to Aegon, and he mounts their heads on spikes atop the city's walls. He also decides to avenge Aegon's son, Jaehaerys, by sending an assassin of his own to murder Rhaenyra. He sends Sir Aric Cargyll to Dragonstone in order to get the job done. Sir Aric's instructions from Sir Criston are very clear. He is supposed to pretend to be his brother, sneak into the castle, and slay Rhaenyra whenever he gets the chance. It's a mission that Sir Aric almost succeeds in doing, but he is caught by his brother as he tries to sneak into Rhaenyra's chambers. Afterwards, a duel plays out between the two brothers, and we see this in the trailers, though there are differing accounts about how it actually transpired. Grand Maester Munkin says that the twins fought each other with tears running down their cheeks, and that in the end, they died in each other's arms as brothers. But Mushroom says that the brothers were divided and that they hated each other, and that Sir Eric of the Green Faction died first. Afterwards, as Sir Eric died of his mortal wounds in the upcoming days, he cursed his brother until his last breath. It will be interesting to see which version the show chooses to go with, Grand Maester Munkins or Mushrooms. However, the impact of this event on Rhaenyra is big as it plants the seeds of paranoia and distrust that will become very important later on in the story. However, 
The immediate effects of it are that her lords become concerned about Sir Kristen Cole's next strategy, a strategy that forces her to have to respond. Sir Kristen, realizing that he cannot defeat the Black Faction on the sea, starts attacking the castles and strongholds of the lords that support Rhaenyra on land, burning the surrounding villages, killing the small folk, and looting their resources. In response, Rhaenyra sends Rhaenys to deal with this problem, and Rhaenys arrives with her dragon, Meles. However, this is exactly what Sir Kristen was hoping for. Then came an answering roar. Two more winged shapes appeared. The king astride Sunfire the Golden, and his brother Aemond upon Vagar. Kristen Cole had sprung his trap, and Rhaenys had come snatching at the bait. Surprisingly, Rhaenys didn't flee from the obvious danger that she was in. Instead, she met her end like a true dragon rider, fighting with fire and blood until the end. It's said that the dragons danced for quite a while up in the sky, and that there were bursts of fire so bright that it almost seemed as though there were several suns in the sky. This battle was remembered as the Battle of Rook's Rest, and it is likely to be a highlight in Season 2. However, Rhaenys could not hope to survive the ambush of both Sunfire and Vagar, and so she perished in the fighting along with her dragon. Also, Aegon was maimed and injured as a result of the battle, and so too was Sunfire, once the most beautiful dragon ever seen. With the king in a comatose state, Aemond would sit the Iron Throne as Lord Protector of the Realm until such time that his brother returned to consciousness. Meanwhile, on the wall, get it? Because of the book. Okay. In Winterfell, Jaceris receives a warm welcome by the Lord of the North, Cregan Stark, and he even forms a good friendship with him in the book. It's said that Jaceris and Lord Cregan would drink together, hunt together, train together, and that they even swore an oath of brotherhood sealed in blood. This pact becomes known as the Pact of Ice and Fire in which Jace promises that once he sires a daughter with Bela, he will send her to the north to be fostered in Winterfell, so that she can grow fond of Cregan's son, Rickon, and eventually marry him. However, Jace also meets a girl in Winterfell named Sora Snow, and allegedly he has an affair with her. It's said that Sora Snow was Lord Cregan's bastard half-sister, and that she provided Jace comfort after the death of his little brother. It's possible that the storyline could be removed from the plot, especially since the source that it's based on is so unreliable. Also, it seems like the show is changing a lot from the book, because in Fire and Blood, Jace and Cregan never go to the wall. In fact, it's said that the dragons don't do well when they're near the wall, presumably because of the cold and ancient magic that has bound the wall for all these years. Usually, the dragons refuse to go anywhere near it, but perhaps the show might change this since Game of Thrones has already created a precedent of dragons going beyond the wall. We'll see how this turns out, however. Regardless, the main point of this plotline is to show that Jaceris secures the support of the Northerners and that Lord Cregan does end up joining the Black Faction. However, since the Northern lands are so vast and wide and cold, the army takes longer to gather. Therefore, Jaceris goes back to Dragonstone by himself with a promise from Lord Cregan of his full support. Lord Cregan does, in the meantime, send a smaller force of veteran soldiers ahead of his army to help the Black Faction in the Riverlands. These soldiers are remembered as the Winter Wolves, and I do talk about them more in another video of mine. For now though, the important thing to note is that Jace returns to Dragonstone having succeeded in the North, and that Cregan Stark will be an important ally in the future. When Jaceris arrives on Dragonstone, he comes to find that the Black Faction's leadership is divided. Corlys blamed Rhaenyra for the death of his wife, and so he had exchanged angry words with Rhaenyra after the Battle of Rook's Rest. It should have been you, the Sea Snake shouted at her grace. Staunton sent you, yet you left it to my wife to answer and forbade your sons to join her. Therefore, when Jace arrived at Dragonstone, the first thing that he did was to reconciliate his mother with his grandfather and to salvage the split between the faction's leadership. 
he lulled Corliss in with a plan of strategy which he believed would help them take the city of King's Landing. The Targaryens had now ruled Westeros for a little more than a hundred years, but they had always considered Dragonstone as their main seat of power. Even before Aegon I conquered Westeros, the Targaryens had been on Dragonstone for hundreds of years. Some Targaryen lords would sometimes wander down to the nearby villages to seek pleasure from the daughters and wives of their subjects. The Targaryens were considered to be closer to gods, so many of their subjects saw it as an honor to be bedded by the Targaryen lords, and maybe even close to a blessing to bear Targaryen bastard. These bastards were even referred to as dragon seeds by the locals. Therefore, Jace's plan was pretty straightforward find these dragon seeds and encourage them to claim dragons so that the black faction could have enough firepower to take King's Landing by force. Though many dragon seeds tried to claim dragons, only four of them were ultimately successful. Ulf the White, Hugh Hammer, Adam of Hall, and Nettles. Ulf the White was a man at arms with pale hair and who claimed Silverwing, once the dragon of Queen Alisan. He later on became acquainted with a big Hell King blacksmith named Hugh the Hammer, another dragon seed who ended up claiming Vermithor, once the dragon of King Jaehaerys the Conciliator. Then there is Adam of Hull, rumored to be the son of Laenor, but more likely to be the bastard son of Corlys Velaryon. In the book, he claims Sea Smoke, once the dragon of Laenor, but since Laenor is still alive, he might claim another dragon in the story. It's possible that he might end up claiming Grey Ghost, one of the wild dragons that roam the island. In the book, there are three wild dragons on Dragonstone, Grey Ghost, Sheep Stealer, and the Cannibal. Grey Ghost was a pale grey-white dragon who dwelt in caves and hunted in the sea. She feasted on fish and was seldom seen but by fishermen, the locals of Dragonstone describing her as a shy beast who avoided men and their works for years. Grey Ghost was a bit similar to Sheep Stealer in nature, as Sheep Stealer also tried to avoid people, but he was more likely to be seen on fields feasting on the flocks of sheep around the island. She was only a terror for the shepherds, though they would only face her fury if they dared to interfere with her as she ate their livestock. Sheep Stealer only had a taste for mutton, unlike the cannibal who had a taste for his own kind. The cannibal was a large and old dragon that feasted on the flesh of other dragons. He had coal black scales and baleful green eyes, and some chroniclers believed that he had lived on Dragonstone way before the Targaryens even arrived on the island, though such accounts are unlikely. In Fire and Blood, Nettles is the only one who manages to claim a wild dragon. The histories say that she claimed Sheep Stealer and that she had achieved the feat through cunning and persistence. It's likely that she did this by feeding him slaughtered sheep every day until she learned to respect and accept her. With Nettles riding Sheep Stealer, Jaceres finally had enough dragon riders to launch his attack on King's Landing, and soon the Black Faction was preparing to do just that. Only, Sir Otto's letter writing had actually worked. And on the day that they were supposed to leave, the ships of the Triarchy appeared on the horizon. It's said that the Triarchy had brought 90 ships to assault the Valarian fleet, and that they attacked the Blacks in the port city of Driftmark. Afterwards, the largest and bloodiest naval battle in Westerosi history transpired, and it was a devastating conflict for both sides. Though the Blacks had five dragons and a strong Valarian fleet, Corliss would lose a third of it, along with the entire port city and all of its treasures. Also, Rhaenyra's son, Viserys, would disappear in the chaos of battle, and Luke would die along with his dragon, Arax, being shot from the sky and crashing into the sea. On the other hand, the Triarchy would lose almost all of their ships, with only 28 of them surviving out of the 90 that had fought in the battle. In the end, the Triarchy turned back and fled, and the Battle of the Gullet, as it's remembered in history, was ultimately a victory for the Black Faction. Meanwhile, in the Reach, the Green Faction secures some victories of their own, as Daeron Targaryen helps the Hightower army win a great victory in the Battle of the Honeywine. Daeron was the youngest son of Alicent Hightower, 
and had been fostered in Old Town, serving as a cupbearer for his great uncle, Lord Hobart Hightower. He had a blue she-dragon named Tarsarian, and in the Battle of Honeywine, he helped the Green Forces defeat the combined forces of the Lords Costain, Beesbury, and Tarly of the Reach. For this, he was given the Valarian sword Vigilance as a gift, and he was nicknamed as Dayron the Daring. Though he'll be an important character for the future of the story, it's still uncertain whether or not they'll include him in season 2 of the show. However, the show will probably end in the same way that the chapter in the book does, with Aemond and Sir Criston believing that Rhaenyra and Daemon are at Harrenhal, rushing over there to force a battle and arriving to find the castle empty and abandoned. Turns out that Daemon and Rhaenyra's forces were already near King's Landing, and that they had surrounded the city with their army and dragons. They ultimately take the city, and Rhaenyra ascends the Iron Throne. In the book, it's said that Alicent bowed her head in defeat, surrendering the keys to the castle and ordering her knights and men-at-arms to lay down their swords. The city is yours, princess, she is reported to have said, but you will not hold it long. The rats play when the cat is gone, but my son, Aemond, will return with fire and blood. After this confrontation, Rhaenyra sat herself on the Iron Throne, where Aegon the Dragon, Maegor the Cruel, and Jaceris the Conciliator had sat before her. She was the only woman to ever sit upon the Iron Blades, and the book says that she was stern-faced in her steel armor as she did. Every man and woman in the Red Keep knelt before her, pleading for her forgiveness and swearing their fealties anew. But those that looked closely could notice that Rhaenyra had also cut herself upon the blades. Drops of blood fell to the floor as she went past, and wise men looked at one another, though none dared speak the truth aloud. The Iron Throne had spurned her, and her days upon it would be few. So that's everything that's likely to happen in Season 2 of House of the Dragon. Which of these events are you most looking forward to seeing? Let me know down below in the comments section, and if you like this video, click the thumbs up and subscribe for more content. Thank you for watching. Peace.